Hello and welcome to Live Signing. I'm Neil Blumenthal and we are interviewing Mike Hayes, the author of Never Enough. If you haven't yet, please go to premiercollectibles.com slash never enough and you can order a signed copy of Never Enough. And we're gonna talk to Mike just about his life of service and this amazing book. So Mike, Mike's an old friend um, and somebody who uh, I look up to and get in, inspired from. Uh, Mike, tell us, uh, what made you become a, a, a Navy SEAL? Well, first of all, thanks to Premier Collectibles for hosting the event. It's incredible. And then Neil, most importantly, thanks for your friendship, partnership in, in doing something like this back and forth today. There's nothing more fun than, than a conversation with, with Neil. Uh, why to be a SEAL? That's a great question. I think ultimately what I didn't realize at age 19, 20, 21 was really how committed to service I was at the time becoming a SEAL was just leaning into the hardest thing that I could do in front of me and, and, and trying to, trying to do that thing. Uh, and then throughout life, I've, I've learned a lot and, and, uh, you know, I, I joined the SEALs well before 9-11 and never aspired to be in any sort of combat or anything like that. I just wanted to go do the hardest thing that I could in front of me. And then the world changed a lot and, um, and ended up going through, through quite a bit of, of leadership and great days and hard days in the SEALs. Well, uh, you know, when I read this book, it's like you've lived 10 lives, right? Um, you were commander of SEAL Team 2. You uh, were in charge of an entire special operations group in Afghanistan. Uh, you were a White House fellow. You went into the private sector working for leading technology and finance companies like Cognizant um, and Bridgewater, and now a senior executive at VMware. Um, and your book, Never Enough, right, has all these lessons uh, that, that you've learned uh, along the way. Um, tell us, uh, what was the, the hardest thing about SEAL training? Well, I'll circle back to that in a second. As you noted, I have some Washington, D.C. time, so I'm really good at answering the question that you didn't ask. <laughs> and so, uh, well, first of all, for the, for the viewers, a little context on how Neil and I met. You know, I, I love speaking in public, not because I like public speaking. I love speaking in public because it's an opportunity to share and, um, and, and just give back. Uh, I've lived a life of, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of once in a lifetime experiences. I was speaking in, at an event for Goldman a, a long time ago that was honoring the, the world's top 100 innovators. And that's actually the event where Neil and I met. Neil was an honoree. Like he's, for those of you who don't know, Neil started a, a little company called Warby Parker. And, uh, and that little company has become a really big company. And so uh, Neil's a real a, a leader in fashion and optics. And even most importantly, the thing that Neil and I really uh, share an interest in is making the world better. Every pair of glasses that Warby Parker sells they donate one to a person in need. And so that's just a beautiful business model and certainly one that I've been behind my whole, you know, the whole time I've known Neil. So uh, the the reason- Thank you, I, I didn't pay Mike to, to say that, but I, I appreciate no, that, it. No, that, yeah, in fact, nobody asked me. Yeah, that was not part of the, uh, the mandatory, uh, that was not a public service announcement. That's from the heart. Like Neil's a special, special person and a, and a really great friend. And, and, you know, we like to, it, it, anyways, so by now, Neil, I've forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, we know that SEAL training is one of the most difficult things ever. Um, and right, part of the title it comes from that. Uh, what, when you're in your hardest day in BUDS training, um, and maybe you can tell the audience what BUDS training is, what keeps you going? Great. So Bud's basic underwater demolition SEAL training. It is, John F. Kennedy started the SEALs on January 1st, 1962 to create a special operations capability for the nation. And most of, most of the world now by now has heard of SEALs. What uh, is really foundational to the SEALs is wanting to live a life of service and, and orient, being oriented more for others than self and uh, leaning into the nation's hardest of problems. So in SEAL training, it's, it's physically very, very hard, 
But you know, everybody who shows up to SEAL training is qualified to get through. You can do so many pull-ups and push-ups and run so fast. The thing that, that differentiates in SEAL training is really the mental aspect of it. It's the grit, the determination, and just continuing to think about the, the, what you're trying to achieve and working back from that and saying, hey, I'll, I'll pay any price that it takes to go be, be part of this organization that gets to do great things. And my class of 120, ultimately 19 graduated. So, you know, it, it, at age 20 or 21, people come out of SEAL training and, um, and, and really at that young age think like I've, I've really got accomplished something, which is true. But then I think what's really critically important is also to very quickly learn that, and this is one of the messages in the book in Never Enough, is that, look, we all have different skills and abilities and, and, um, and gifts and interests. And so how do we as people, as citizens, as family members, as friends, how do we, A, make ourselves better, but B, uh, think about contributing in ways that make the most sense. A lot of people say, hey, Mike, thanks for your service. I like to flip that around and say, thanks for yours and understand like, well, what, is, what are your interests? It's just like, Neil, you didn't grow up as saying, hey, I'm gonna lean into the seals, but man, you're making a huge difference in the world. Like everybody serves in different ways. And so that's what I think is really, really important. The title Never Enough can, uh, is intentionally, uh, intentionally um, uh, a little bit uh, uh, pointy. And the reason I did that was because Never Enough is not about fame and fortune. Never enough is about meaning and impact. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you answered that question because Eric from Norman, Oklahoma uh, posed that question. And um, a reminder, please go to premiercollectibles.com slash never enough uh, to place an order for a signed copy. Um, in the book, during Bud's training, and you just mentioned it, you know, it was more a mental challenge than a physical one, but the physical ones are real, right? You're uh, running around with holding boats on your head, holding logs, um, wading into the surf and freezing cold waters. I mean, you grew up in the Northeast, you know what cold water is like. Um, how, when you're in a really difficult situation, um, how do you persevere? Great question. Maybe I could even answer that with a little bit of a story. In SEAL training, and, and this is one of the stories in the book, so a little bit of spoiler alert, but don't worry, it's only a very quick part of the book. I tell a story about how in SEAL training, we as students had to run two miles as fast as we humanly could. You know, you're, it's summertime, you're running in boots and long pants and soft sand, and it's, it's, look, it's not fun, but you just put your head down and you run your two miles as fast as you humanly can. Then the instructors corralled the whole class together and said, all right, class, that was actually the slowest average time that we've ever seen in the history of SEAL training. You guys have to do that again. And in that moment, when you've just given it absolutely everything you, you, you have, and then somebody says you have to do it again, that can be kind of demoralizing. And so what's interesting is, look, everybody can pick themselves up and go run two miles again. But when, if, if I'm observing people in that situation, I can tell a lot from their body language. Some people in that moment, when they get told to do that again, you know, they're just, they're, they're looking at their feet, they, their posture slumps, their eyes look down. They just, you can just see the deflation. What really is like the mentality of a seal is like, okay, bring it, let's go, let's just go do the next thing. What do we have to do? And you get into a, a rhythm of just tackling the hardest things that are in front of you. And then what happened after that second run was really funny. Uh, not funny at the time, the instructors divided us into two, two groups. We didn't know what the division was, but one group had beat their, the, the time of their first two mile run. The second group did not beat the time on their second time around. So they told the first group, uh, hey, you know, how in the world did you possibly beat your time? You should have given it everything you had on the first session. And the inverse, they said to the other group. So no matter what, whether you beat your time or you didn't beat your time, it was, you were wrong. And they said, you, that's not what it means to be a SEAL. You know, you always have more to give and you always run, can, can dig deeper and be more and be faster. And ultimately in SEAL training, what we do is to the trainees is we stretch them beyond their limits and then make them comfortable again. And then we stretch them be, even further beyond their limits. My hands are probably going off screen, but what we, we can imagine a, a series, a, a pattern of constantly being stretched past your limits. A couple things happen. Number one is you get comfortable with discomfort. Then that's a really important trait to uh, not just a seal, I think for life. 
And so a lot of the things that we're talking about right now may seem unrelatable, but that's but what I tried to do in Never Enough was make them relatable. So if you read the book, I think you'll hear stories like this and see how relatable it is because they, they this, this really, it's just a, a metaphor for larger life. But nonetheless, when you, when you get uncomfortable and stretch beyond those limits, two things happen. The, the limits get further and further out. But most importantly, you get more comfortable living on the edge in that uncomfortable zone where, where, where many people don't even ever go. So then when you're on missions overseas, you're like, okay, this is sure it's hard, but you have a pattern in your head of being able to do hard things, be more, be logical, talk well, be calm. And all things that are really important when you're getting shot at or rocketed or doing, trying to do some crazy mission overseas. And so that's really the foundation, Neil, of, of the SEAL teams is that six months of training in Coronado, California, that bring people to the edge of human misery, but most importantly, make them really need to be to focus on the mental. I remember a story from the book where you're sitting in the surf, absolutely miserable, um, and you're with uh, someone who becomes one of your best friends, um, and you guys are sort of suffering, but then laughing. Why were you laughing? I wish I could take credit for being the one who initiated the laughter, but my really, really close friend, a guy named Chris Cassidy, who actually is a, an astronaut for the nation. He was just up in the International Space Station for his second time a, a couple months ago. And uh, Chris and I, Chris was from Maine. I was from Rhode, from Rhode Island. And the two of us were as cold as can be. But we just kind of stepped back and we're like, you know, it, it is kind of a humor, a humorous event when you're, you know, at 20 or 21, you feel like a grown adult at that point. And you're like, we're here jackhammering, you know, shivering in the water uncontrollably and can't get out. Like it just, it, you just gotta be able to find the humor in a situation like that. Chris did. And when Chris started laughing, I started laughing, others started laughing. And can you imagine being the, the SEAL instructors that are trying to like effectively, they don't use the word torture, but that's absolutely what it is. And so imagine being those SEAL instructors watching a class that you're trying to torture laughing back at you. It's, it was really a powerful moment and a very vivid memory. You know, it's interesting, one of the themes um, that you've been mentioning and that's in the book is just about how do you create a different context, right, for evaluating a situation. In this case, right, you're, you've been up for a couple days, um, you're miserable, shivering in, in the cold, um, and you can either, right, look down and, and, and be upset and be suffering, or you can change the context and, and laugh about it. Um, and uh, you've seen throughout your career um, to just constantly change the context, um, no, no matter what the situation is. Changing that context is the key, right? And, and uh, let's even take that to, to make it relatable. Let's look at the pandemic. Look at the last year that the whole world and, and, and has had. You know, on a, on a relative basis, everybody, everybody has had it, had it harder. But the thing that you learn in the SEALs is that not everybody has an equally hard day at the same time. So it is relative. So, it, so how do you look for the person who is having the harder day and go help that person? Look, there's nothing to laugh about from this last year. There's been tons of loss and suffering and pain for many, many people. But the, the thing that, that I try to bring out in Never Enough is that mentality of what you just said, which is shift the context. You know, I got great advice from a, a, a guy who passed away a few years ago named John Whitehead, very special American. He was the CEO of Goldman Sachs for a long time, then uh, Deputy Secretary of State with George Schultz, just a wonderful human. But, but John, John was a, uh, drove the, um, the uh, landing craft into the beach at Omaha. He was one of the Navy guys that, that shuttled the Marines in the, uh, into, the, into the beach. So John uh, lived a life of wisdom. And he said, Mike, whenever you're having a bad day, Go find somebody who's having a harder day and lift them up. That's the context shifting. And I think that's the kind of thing that can apply certainly to the pandemic and certainly larger than life. And that's why I want to emphasize this isn't just a book of, about SEAL stories. While there are certainly some great SEAL stories in there, it is a much larger book around meaning, purpose, and impact. Absolutely. And I think we're seeing that, right? One of the top selling business books, one of the top selling leadership and, and motivation books, um, and I know uh, for me, somebody who's never served, but one piece of advice that I received that's exactly aligned with what you're just saying, the best thing you can do for your career is to help others. 
And it's the best thing that you can do also for your personal happiness, um, right? And totally. And, and you know, that's a, a great chance for me to kind of appreciate the uninte maybe unintended softball, but all of my profits from this book are going to a 501c3, a charity that I started that pays off mortgages for Gold Star families. So Gold Star, I, I like almost every seal of my era have buried about, you know, 40 or so friends and, and some is some is as close as brothers, you know, real, real, real brothers of mine. And it's, and it's been hard. I don't know if you can, if you're looking, you can see two flags over my shoulder. Those are special flags to me. And so, you know, I, I uh, the number of people who bear the visible and invisible uh, marks of this almost two decades of combat are much, much more significant than people would realize. I've been able to very quietly pay off mortgages at this point. I've paid off five mortgages for widows who lost their husbands in the war. And then they, you know, their, their you know, children and, and uh, families just can get brought back up and hopefully, you know, get back on their feet and whatnot. So anyways, Never Enough for Me is much more than a book. It's a mission. It's a mission to go make a difference on so many levels, to share thoughts or advice, to inspire, or also literally to raise money to be able to move 100% of my profits are going to the, to the charity. So if you go to pre premiercollectibles.com slash never enough, you can get a signed copy. All the proceeds um, go to uh, support Gold Star families. Um, tell us, Mike, when you eventually uh, became commander of the Special Operations Group in Afghanistan, you had to make split second life ending decisions. Um, how do you go about, what's your decision-making framework in, in a situation like that? It's, thanks for asking, Neil. The decision framework for me is quite simple in theory, sometimes harder to practice, but the theory is to first think about when you need to make your decision. A lot of people just jump in and from intuition say, we should go do X or Y or Z. When you're trying to make a hard decision, the first thing you want to think about is that outcome that you're trying to achieve and have real clarity around the outcome. My grad school professor said, Mike, beware of fast trains to the wrong station. That always stuck with me. So yeah. first, make sure you're going to the right station. That's, that's kind of like I, I described the vision, which is where you're going, the strategy, which is uh, how you get there. And then there's the execution part of it. And so when you think about the strategy, and this, by the way, this isn't just some SEAL operation center thing. This is in business. This is in life. Like, how do, we, how do we make our decisions? And so to me, that first part, the first decision in decision making is the when. So as you, you try to get the best information you can, as fast as you can, as much as you can, and then there's a cost associated with time. At some point, waiting longer to make a decision starts costing more than the value it provides. And you hit like an inflection point. That's when you wanna make your decision because you do it with optimal information. And so I know it sounds kind of mathy or sciencey, but but with practice, what you do is you, you, you get those inputs and you make the best informed decision you can. The number of times I've had people say, hey, sir, we gotta make a decision in two seconds on this thing. I'm like, no, 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 we can wait two weeks or the inverse. We have, we, let's go make this decision and we have, we're okay. We can wait for tomorrow. No, 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 we gotta do this now. And because I'm seeing the pattern and, and it's a, it, these comes from, you know, a career of intuitions and experience. Wisdom, I like to say, is just a, a series of learnings from mostly from mistakes and things that we've done wrong. And so that's the, the also a great point to bring up around, you said career advice. I loved your advice, Neil. And what I would also say is always lean into that hardest thing because in life, you're either going to succeed or you're going to fail, but then pause for a second. Take that failure and then go one more step down in that logic tree node and say, did you learn or not learn? I would argue that it's only failure if you fail and don't learn. Because if you failed and you learned, now you're going to input that back into your life. And, that, and you're going to learn from that. You're going to, if you think about what, you did, what, what the actual learning was, and this is what I've done my whole life, and that's what literally is in this pages of this book. You got 30 years of learning that I've, I've processed and thought about and then distilled. And so that I think is what feeds the loop. So the, the, the biggest error you can make in a career is not trying the hardest thing. And uh, sorry, one more point on that while I'm on the roll. I think, why don't we try hard things? Neil, you know, you and I, I think are wired pretty much the same. I think about, a, uh, we're, not, we're not afraid to be embarrassed. You know, we, we're not afraid to do something wrong because people know what our heart and our head is. You know, when you judge people on their 
intent rather than their action, then, then that's the right place to be judging because I very rarely meet people that wake up and say, I wanna go screw something up today. But, but when things get screwed up, look, move from that action down into the intent level and say, okay, what, how does that feed in to that learning cycle? So sorry, Neil, long answer to a very simple question. No, it's so true. Um, and sort of that point of ego and the opposite of ego, humility, something that you speak a lot to in the, in the book, right? We, you know, sometimes are fooled into following narcissistic leaders, um, right? And those narcissistic leaders are the opposite of what you're describing, people that serve, that ask how they can help. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about humility. Can you give us an example of how uh, humility has sort of helped you in your career? It goes back to the decision-making framework. So let me, when, I, when I'm making an important decision, let's use the SEAL example. I'm running an operation center and we need to decide whether we drop a bomb on a building or not. And so, or, so that to me, I don't, I absolutely cannot handle getting that wrong. That's a really important decision to make. How do we make that decision? I operate at two levels. I'm an input and I'm the decider. So I might have a view on how something could go, but by separating and seeing myself at two levels, now I go get other inputs because what I value is a little bit of conflict in an organization. I want to bring in people who don't think like me with people who have different experiences. We talk rightfully so a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion today. One part of that is not is, is making sure that we have diverse and inclusive opinions so that literally when I'm deciding to drop a bomb and I think we should, we should and somebody else is next to me and said, no, 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 well, what about this? I, I might, I need to slow down and say, and, and operate at those two levels because I need to listen to that person who has that alternate viewpoint, because that's where, that's how you ultimately increase the odds of success. And, um, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like buying a stock. Like, should you buy shares of GameStop? You know, like, don't you want to like stop and ask people who have an opinion that's not yours and then think through your own opinion plus their opinion, you know, and that might, that's how we make better decisions. Couldn't agree more. At Warby Parker, one of our core values is presume positive intent. So that way we can have those intellectual debates, right? When you're trying to gather inputs, when you're trying to get recommendations, right? Don't question the intention of the person providing those inputs um, if they're part of your team and you trust them, right? You wanna evaluate you know, the recommendations and the inputs on their own. So you can actually have uh, uh, a, a debate, an intellectually honest debate and discussion. And, and Neil, let me flip and ask you a question. I already know the answer, but it's great for your, 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 the audience to hear. Have you or anyone in your organization ever judged somebody and brought, knocked them down a notch for bringing one of those different ideas forward and that what, and a, on a choice that wasn't made? You know, like when you, when you have that diversity of opinion, T tell me, has anybody suffered any sort of consequences at Warby Parker for bringing an idea forward? No, they, they get promoted, right? And in the beginning of meetings, we often have quick wins, learnings, and hat tips, right? And we want to celebrate, right, when somebody learns something or, again, it's not failure if you learn from it. Totally. And I, I think it's also a little bit like I described three phases of a career, First phase is getting out and trying to show the world you're really good at something. Excuse, excuse me. First phase is building a foundation and getting good at something. The second phase is really uh, trying to show the world you're great. And then some people never make it to that last phase of their career, which is they're so, com they're so comfortable knowing that they're good at what they do. They no longer need to worry about that judgment because they, they can stand in front of a room and in, in, in an egoless kind of way say, hey, you know what? I made a mistake or the sign, sign, things that leaders say are, I don't know, or just that honesty and transparency of what's happening in a situation. That actually brings me to uh, a question from the audience. Chris from Dallas is asking, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? <laughs> I've received a lot. One thing that comes to mind is always take the good job now. 
<laughs> so there's a guy named Rick Smethers. He's, I have lost touch with Rick, but he was a commanding officer of a SEAL unit. And, you know, there's, there, there can be a tendency in life to take, do the, do the hard thing now because it'll pay off later from a career standpoint, but like really analyze what makes you happy and what makes you, um, makes, gives you energy. What are you good at? And what does a business need? Because ultimately, if you can thread those three circles of, of happiness, abilities, and in a business need, you're going to be really, really thriving. And so sometimes we defer some of that because we think it'll lead to something later on. The thing that Rick told me that resonated with me was if you focus on all three of those circles now, you're actually going to be, uh, be on the best path of success because you'll be approaching your day-to-day -day with that passion and the energy that you have. I want to take uh, another question from the audience. Heather from Orlando asked, who are the people who have most shaped your life and, and how? I've got a lot of answers to that one too, but let me tell you about my grandfather. My grandfather was Naval Academy class of 1940, uh, served in the Navy for uh, 30 years. He was at Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor on that day of infamy, December 7th, 1941. He lived a life that was extraordinary. Uh, after surviving Pearl Harbor, he ended up becoming a pilot in World War II and went on, was the first helicopter pilot in the Navy and flew search and rescue in Korea. Just a real great, great character. And he uh, le left many indelible marks on me, but never by saying, hey, Mike, you should go do X, Y, or Z, or here's what you should be when you grow, when you grow up. He always taught me how to treat people. He always taught me by example what to do or how to handle that hard situation when you're frustrated out with the anything from the person that's checking you out in the in, in you know when you're ringing your groceries or people that or or, or you know any sing, any sort of you know job that people that we can sometimes look past. My grandfather never looked past anyone, and so he just taught me how to how to how to give back and how to think about everybody as value in different ways. And um, ultimately some great advice my grandfather gave, gave me when I got commissioned into the Navy in 1993 was, uh, was that he stepped forward, put his hand on my shoulder and, and kind of just said, Mike, this country is really special. He said, you're even more special. He said, I want you to remember this. He said, Mike, don't die for your country go on living for it. And, you know, after many close calls in the seals, I always, I always heard my grandfather, you know, I've been shot at, I've been rocketed. I've helped amputate a teammate's leg. I've jumped out of a building rig to explode. I've, you know, I've been, I've been held at gunpoint and threatened with execution. I, I've had a lot of, I've been run over, over by a carnival cruise liner in training in Florida. So, so it wasn't Orlando, but uh, close. And um, so I've had a lot of the, a lot of time to think about what, what is life all about and have that perspective. And I think a lot of that came, came from my grandfather. Will you share a story about one example of your grandfather's heroism, right? When he was in Pearl Harbor, the first wave came um, and then what, what did he do, right? He could have stayed, um, he, he had the day off. Is, is that how the story goes? Yeah, well, first of all, the Hayes family used to be the O'Hayes family and, uh, and, you know, good Irish Catholic drinking family. I don't know if we, we hope, <laughs> yeah. but on Sunday morning, he had been out all Saturday night with a bunch of his buddies. They were in a bungalow. And when they heard the first wave, like you said, from the book, he, you know, he, he, he couldn't corral anybody and get them to go back, you know, into the, the, their, their battle stations, if you will. My grandfather actually said the hardest part of Pearl Harbor was driving by the Marine gate guard at 40 miles an hour in the Jeep that he commandeered because he thought the Marine was going to shoot him. <laughs> so, but he made, he got back on the, his ship for the third wave. And then sure enough, uh, you know, he, he had his, his ship was halfway was ha sunk and, um, and uh, there was a lot of hard, hard things around him. And so he such bravery. I often, it took me, I didn't appreciate it when I was younger, but it took me several years, but I really recognized as a SEAL and thought back on that story, how my grandfather was really brave and just moving into the situation rather than having an excuse to stay aside. That's uh, uh, true heroism. 
how after right being in the seals being a commander um how do you think about having impact afterwards uh you ended up uh applying to the white house fellows program um which uh is uh equally elite to the Navy SEALs in terms of the number of applicants versus people that are accepted. Um, how do you think about being a, a White House fellow um, and how you could continue to extend your impact? I always think about trying new things and grow, growing laterally. In life, we can either go, go stay, stay narrower and go deeper or we can spread ourselves out broader. And by definition, the broader you are, you can't be quite as deep. I personally like to be broader and shallower. That's more my, my, my personal interest. And so as I thought about the opportunity to be a White House fellow, I knew it would give me lots of exposure and opportunities to learn and to be around great people. I like to say that we're the average of the people we hang out with. So the opportunity to be with 13 other people who are incredibly experienced in very, very different ways, all different professions and walks of life was Oh, super humbling, super exciting, and it pulled me up. So the thing that I think about as far as, you know, moving, um, you know, to, after 20 years in the SEALs and moving to the private sector is, you know, the question that I get a lot is, how do you find meaning after 20 years in the SEALs? And it's, it's relatively easy, actually, surprisingly. The, the thing that I think about is contributing to society in ways that make us more productive. You know, the just a really the really quick version, econ 101, economics 101. Think, remember, gross domestic product is just labor times productivity. So while labor, that's fertility rates and my immigration policy, the real determinant is how productive are we? And so the more productive we are as a com as a country, whether you're some small business or a large business like I'm at in VMware now with $11 billion in revenue, what we do is we make places more productive. And that productivity creates more GDP. And then our national policymakers have an opportunity to then buy more SEALs or healthcare, education, you know, pay down debt, et cetera. So really everybody who can play a part in creating more, a stronger economy really is, an, is strengthening the fabric of our nation because we get, to, we get to do the things that we want to be doing as a nation, which is lifting the entire population up and, and, and ri raising the level for everybody. The awesome way to view at it, right? How, what are all of our roles in making America stronger, right? Whether it's uh, through serving in the military or uh, being in the private sector, um, or in this case, you know, sharing wisdom through writing Never Enough and providing all the proceeds to, to Gold Star families. Um, one thing that uh, I've taken and stolen from you is uh, every day when I'm dropping my kids off at school, um, I tell them, make it a great day. And I learned that from you. W where does that come from? I wish I knew the answer to that, Neil. It's just what I've always done. My daughter's 20 years old. And when she was zero, I thought, there were, not zero, but when she was very young, she was going off for the first time. And and I thought, you know, have, it just hit me. Have is a passive verb that kind of means that the world will happen to you. And at that early age, I said, no, go make it a great day because make is an active verb. And so just flipping that mindset of like, don't let the world happen to you. Go happen to the world. Go make it a great day. The, the, a corollary is, you know, you can't make me have a bad day. I'm the only, you might try like heck, but I'm the only one who can actually make me have a bad day. I've had plenty of bad days, don't get me wrong, but it's all, uh, it's, it's all controllable from, from inside. Now, obviously, I don't like it when a lot of people try to make me have a bad day because it takes a lot of work to try to fend that off. But no, I think the real core of what you're saying is the difference between a passive and an active orientation to the way we think about how we engage with family, friends, and strangers as we walk, go through life. I want to take another question uh, from the audience. Frank from Louisville. Uh, first, he thanks you for, for your service um, and asks if you could go on a car ride with anyone except for your spouse, um, who, who would it be? 
Well, hey, Frank, I just I do want to emphasize I'm signing these things in, in, in these book plates and I've got one right for you. The question is so hard. So I'm going to buy myself just a little bit of time and think about who that would be. And just I want people to understand that Premier Collectibles has sent stacks of the, these book plates for me. I'm signing one for absolutely every single one of you that buys a book. So it, it is literally that's my, my I'm, I'm a. I've got my homework assignment and I'll very, very gladly do this because I, do, I am so excited about getting the, the message and the meaning of never enough out to the world and hopefully supporting those gold star families. So the thing that I would emphasize, my answer would be President Lincoln. Uh, you didn't say alive or dead, I'm gonna say dead's okay. Look, Lincoln is the, the great uniter. And, and in so many different ways, we all know that's, that, that era of civil war, we know the 18, you know, the 1850s and the, 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 the young 1860s kind of era in our nation's history. Look, we can, I think that Lincoln was such a, um, such a crafty guy because he knew how to, in a nuanced way, make something happen. You know, the, wor the world at that time too was very polarized, very polarized. And see, the thing is, is how in, in a polarized world, and I'm not judging here, if you're, a, you're one side or the other, there's, there's a way that the nation makes decisions. The decision way to make decisions isn't by, by extreme polarization. It's through uh, guys, people like leaders like a Lincoln or citizens like a Lincoln before he was president in order to kind of navigate and bring things together. So look, it, it, it was a challenging era in our history, one that we're still advancing and improving upon. But uh, his, I, I really, really enjoyed so many things about him. One other quick Lincoln fact is, that, uh, that some people don't know is that Lincoln wrote a whole heck of a lot to his military leaders, to his, his, his generals out in the field. Lincoln would get really upset because people weren't making enough progress. And, um, and he was driven. Lincoln was a driven man. And what he did was wrote these, you know, anything from one to 30 pages of, of excoriating text. And then he would sit on it. He wouldn't mail it yet. And so I think Lincoln's actually the original guy that was like, hey, don't send the email yet. You might want to sleep on that before you hit send. And so I think that uh, that's, that's how he worked with things very, very wisely to keep in, to try to keep people um, moving together. And um, <clears throat> so a lot of admiration for Lincoln, a little bit of a long rambly answer, but lots to like. Yeah, well, also just that very tactical advice of never communicate to somebody when you're upset, right? Um, and if you want to send that email, you know, maybe sleep on it um, or call the person and, and speak to them on the phone or through a video conference or in person because there's a lot that gets lost in translation when something is uh, written and you can't hear the tone of someone's voice, for example. Um, there's a, another question here from uh, Kristen from Charlotte. Uh, what advice do you have for an incoming college freshman ROTC candidate? Kristen, I used to be you. So uh, I was the incoming, look, my best advice is, um, is don't overthink it. You know, at your age, you know, you, you're not supposed to have everything figured out. I, cert I might sound like I have things figured out. I'm 49 years old. You know, like I've lived a, a life that has, that, that on the one hand could seem very, like a linear, positively steep slope trajectory of a career that goes from point A to, you know, maybe not, hopefully not Z, but, but some letter that's further along. But, you know, when I was your age, I all, the only reason I did ROTC was because I was the oldest of four and it was, a, I had a chance to get a scholarship, leave some money for my parents to, to send the next three to school. I wasn't overthinking things. I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so please don't pressure yourself to have the answers. Look, I'm 49, I don't have all the answers right now. I'm just as confused or lost as, as the next person. And so all, all life is about is a, is a, like I like to say, we just have varying levels of ignorance about every single topic. And so, you know, if you approach life with the humility that Neil talked about earlier, then you're gonna be fine. Now, practically speaking, that's the theory advice. The practical is, hey, there's a lot of stupid stuff you have to do in ROTC. And it seems like a total waste of time, but just remember that it's actually, that sometimes the test is not the test. The test isn't the thing that you're doing in front of you. The test is uh, your, how do you act 
when you do when you're doing things that you don't want to do? Does it get you down, or do you say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to work my way through this? That you're you're developing grit when you're doing those things that you don't feel like doing, whether it's shining your shoes or or whatever that no other college kid has to do. Look, I hated that stuff. Absolutely deplorable, you know? And uh, so I would say, just keep a positive attitude, recognize that you don't have everything figured out. And then, um, and, and that humility will serve you well through your your uh, career. And I, I absolutely wish you the, the best of luck. And thanks for jumping in and serving. And just thank you to everybody who's listening, hopefully and serving in different ways. Yeah, I bet um, when you were a freshman in college, you probably didn't think that you'd be an executive at you know, three of the largest technology and finance institutions uh, in, in the world uh, like, like you are now. Um, what, maybe you could tell us, what are those three institutions, Cognizant, Bridgewater, and VMware, what do they do? Um, and how do you apply some of the lessons that you've learned in leadership to, to the work that you're doing? Great. So. I came out of the seals and went right to Bridgewater, world's largest hedge fund. The, the environment is an awesome environment. It's really an idea meritocracy. How do you get the best ideas, every, every far corner of every possible idea? And then how do you have a culture where that idea rises to the best idea rises to the top and the organization chooses the best idea? That's an awesome aspiration. And, the, and literally the mission is to figure the world out. And so, and then to, you know, and then manage invest in money that's invested into Bridgewater in ways that are accretive for people's, uh, you know, for pensions and, and it's for, you know, for doctors, for, for um, police, for teachers, et cetera. So uh, that, that was a real cool mission. Uh, look, I, I was part of the management side, not the investor. I'm not the, 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 the person making the decisions on exactly where to place the money. That's not, what I'm, that's not what I'm good at. So I think one of the lessons is know what you're good at, be okay with what you're not good at, bring your skills and your abilities and what you're good at forward, and then be okay calling the number of other people because ultimately life's a team. You know, you'll have one person who is incredibly, I don't know, disciplined and can, can really build things and execute really well, but won't have a creative idea ever. And then there'll be the other person who's completely creative, has all kinds of ideas, but can't build anything. You know, it, to, 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 you have to put those two people together in order to create awesomeness. And so just understand that nobody can do it all. And, you know, I of course knew this from the SEALs, but it was a narrower, a narrower mission set. So as I moved into the private sector, I've, I, I've really learned a much broader uh, set of, of experiences and people coming together to be a team. The organization I'm at now, VMware, where I'm responsible for operations and transformation, and it's, it's awesome. It's a, basically um, IT infrastructure. So whether it's, it, we enable other organizations to be more productive and be uh, um, innovative and, and agile and secure through abilities to create, you know, modern application development, modern IT infrastructure and, and IT operations and cutting edge security. And so the, look, the world has become technology. Look how we're meeting right now. And so as, so the, I think that the, we are, we're always going to use technology more and more as we have 5G coming out or edge computing or some of these these um, you know game changing things. If you look at what 4G did, it enabled the Ubers and the you know a lot of the the near real time the, the apps. I can only imagine what 5G is going to bring us. And so I just think that it's really just so exciting to to live in this time right now and just to be able to you know like like be around innovative people like Neil. Imagine you know the the risk that you took starting Warby Parker. That could be a a, a whole show in and of itself. It's just a, such an awesome story. And how do we enable the next generation of Neils and so that they can bring all these, these, this awesomeness to the world. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing at VMware and right, these transformative technologies, even that's enabling us to do this live signing in the midst of a, of a pandemic. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end uh, of the show here. Thank you, everyone who submitted questions. Um, as a reminder, go on to premiercollectibles.com slash never enough uh, and order your signed copy. Uh, Mike, uh, we always have so much fun together. And thank you. As someone that's leading an organization of 3,000 people, um, I take lessons from never enough and I use them every single day. Um, so thank you. Oh, it's a real pleasure. It's always fun to speak with you, Neil. I, I appreciate your time in doing this together. I appreciate Premier Collectibles. I, as I said, I've 
I'm signing my life away. So every single one of you that logs on and buys one of these, it'll be me doing it here probably today. And, um, and I just, please let me just pull back for a second and say how much I appreciate the support for Never Enough. Because like I said, sure, this is a book where I think a lot of people will get a lot out of it. However, it's more than a book. For me, this really is a mission. This is a mission to bring hopefully goodness to the world, but also it, the, all of my profits are going to the nonprofit that pays off mortgages for Gold Star families. And I think that's it's a cause near and dear to my heart. So I greatly appreciate the support and all the friendship. And I just wish everybody out there who watches this a wonderful, wonderful day, week, month, and life. So thank you for your time. And, and um, thank you again, Neil. Thanks, Mike. Take care, everyone. Oh,